we believe it's never too early to talk to kids about climate change. Hi there. Welcome to Everyday Climate Champions, where we speak with community members here in the San Francisco Bay Area about how they're putting real climate solutions into action. Thank you for joining me, Dahlia Masachi, your host for this episode of Everyday Climate Champions. Today's topic is climate conversations for people of all ages. We're celebrating Earth Month with a double-length episode. As the climate crisis heats up, many people naturally want to discuss it with their family and friends. The state of California, as well as parents, students, and teachers in local school districts, are also working on integrating climate literacy into school curricula. While we know that conversations about climate change start us down the road to taking action, it can be a tough topic to bring up. That's why I'm pleased to speak with Anu Ramamurti and Marsha Pugsley. Anu founded Cat Kid Adventure with two Ks, an organization that's dedicated to educating young children about their environment and raising a generation of eco-heroes. Marsha is an active participant in Cat Kid Adventure and a grandmother. She is a retired clinical social worker who focused on children and families. They both live in Palo Alto, California, the ancestral and traditional lands of the Puchun, Tamien, and Muwekma Ohlone peoples. Thanks for being here, Anu and Marsha. Anu, I want to start with you. Can you tell us a little about why it's important to have a climate conversation with kids and maybe even as young as elementary school? The need and willingness by people to tackle the climate crisis is abundantly clear. What's even more clear is that we need everyone to act. Yet our youngest and most earnest and curious citizens, that's kids between ages four and 10, are often left out of the climate conversation when they are in fact a uniquely influential and untapped audience. They are incredible agents of change, especially at home. As much as kids learn from their parents, kids have a massive influence on their parents. According to a 2019 study published in Nature magazine, children are one of the biggest influences in fostering behavior change among parents, including raising concerns about climate change. Kids see things in black and white, and they aren't afraid to call out actions. Parents who come to me and have told me that, you know, they carry a reusable bag or a compost at home, it's because their kids ask them to do it. You know, kids are malleable and building positive eco behaviors is easy when you're young. As adults, we're constantly grappling with trying to replace old habits with mindful behaviors. But what if we could instill planet friendly eco habits right from the start? A Brown University study found that routines and habits take root in children as young as the age of nine. Young kids have an innate love for nature, and if we can help nurture this love for nature and inspire a sense of responsibility and empathy for the planet at a young age, they will hopefully be better leaders when they grow up. So the sooner kids learn about the state of the planet and realize their critical role in preserving the health of the planet, the sooner they will start to take action. And this is why we believe it's never too early to talk to kids about climate change. Marsha, I thought maybe you had something you would like to add. I was thinking that, you know, kids love to be helpful. They look for that, especially when they're young. They want to be part of the family and they want to be doing something and really mimicking the adults around them. So it's really important that there's action that they can mimic that's helpful. And, you know, when there's silence among the adults in a family, it, it leaves a big void for kids. And unfortunately, they often fill it with fear and worry about, well, what's what's happening? Am I, have I done something wrong or is something going to happen to my parents? So it's really important that we talk frankly to children. They can take it as long as you parse it according to, to their age. Yes, I, I think a lot of parents are concerned about protecting their kids from fears or anxieties or to worry about the climate, but it sounds like it's actually a disservice to them 
if you don't talk about it. Absolutely, because they see on television, they'll see fires, floods, and wonder, is that going to happen here? Um, are we in danger? So it is important to speak to it, not to give false hope, but to give accurate information. Like, this is what we can do as a family. Anu, I know Cat Kid Adventure does something called Climate Chats, and I'd love to hear more about that, how it helps parents and caregivers have climate conversations. Climate Chat is something that was inspired by my own experience. When my son was four years old, I used to work on the campaign for in the lead up to the Paris Climate Agreement. I used to take calls at home and he would overhear me talking about work. And one day over breakfast, he said to me, Mama, I know you work on climate change, but what do you really do? And this led to multiple conversations over time. And you could see that the child's mind was able to connect the dots better than we give them credit for. And over time, I realized that parents were having difficulty having these conversations. His friend's parents would often say to me, Anu, you can talk about climate change because you work in the space, but we we can't talk about it. So Kakir Adventure was actually born out of a desire to help families have conversations about climate change. Because climate change isn't really dinner table conversation when it could be. Some of the biggest reasons they gave for not talking to their kids about climate change was that they felt that they didn't have the facts, that they just couldn't keep up with it. There was too much going on. It was too scary and too daunting a topic. The fact that they weren't actually doing anything about it per se themselves. So there was a little bit of guilt associated with it. And very importantly, they felt it was very contentious and didn't want to start an argument or sort of mislead their child or family member into a wrong conversation. So Climate Chat is designed to inspire intergenerational conversations on the issue. It helps to break this climate silence and normalize some of these conversations, right? So Climate Chat is a guided workshop online as well as in person to learn and practice strategies to have fun, meaningful conversations with kids and people of all ages. They first practice thinking about and sharing their own climate stories. How did they come into the issue? And then we also role play some conversations. You know, participants are asked to identify one or two people in their lives. It could be kids, grandkids, friends that they would like to have these conversations with. And then we break up into groups and practice ways to kickstart these conversations. We use an acronym called ECOCHAT. E-C-O-C-H-A-T, and it basically outlines seven ways to have a healthy climate conversation. Do you want to briefly go through what those seven are? They sound very interesting. Sure. The first one is E, which is enjoy the chat. A successful climate chat, either with a child or an adult, basically leaves them feeling very positive and feeling good about the conversation, and they actually want to have that conversation again. Right. So the thing with climate conversations is that you need to have many conversations. It's not about a one and done. So the more conversations, the more we're able to bring people into thinking, oh, this is actually something fun and it's something that I can learn from. It really makes a difference. So be mindful of the energy that you bring to it. And it's much easier if you're not stressed or anxious or nervous. The second is connect with your child or partner and find commonalities. Climate change is a daunting topic, and many people feel scared, judged, or even embarrassed when talking about it. And what we say here is find common values, things that both of you care about. Perhaps it's the shared love for the ocean or traveling, what have you. And when you start to have these conversations at this entry point, it'll foster a connection and help build trust. Treating each conversation as an opportunity just to learn more about your child or your conversation partner is a great way to approach it. The next one is offer to chat again, or the O can also stand for an open door policy. So climate conversations, like I said, are not one and done conversations. Instead, stay connected and keep those channels of communications open. 
ask if we can talk about this again, that's a huge win in continuing to have those discussions. So let's just recap. That's E-C-O. Mm -hmm. And E is for enjoy, C is for connect, and O is for open door. Yes. Then comes chat. So C is for celebrate actions, no matter how big or small. So the best way to combat climate anxiety is actually to take action. You know, whether children bike to school, pack a reusable lunch bag, or share or swap their clothes with friends, let them know that every action counts and is important. And actions in themselves are important, but also what actions do is that they influence more people to act as well. And it motivates other people to do more. And then when you talk about sort of doing things as a group, that again is a huge buffer against climate anxiety. Then comes H, which is honesty is the best policy. This is a really important one because, you know, talking to anybody about climate, we don't always have the facts. And if somebody asks you something that you don't know, it's okay to say, I don't know that. I'm going to look it up. Or maybe it's something you both look up together. And then the next one is ask questions and listen, right? By asking questions and listening to your partner, to your child, it tells a lot in the sense that you will be able to determine how much they already know about the topic, understand where they get their information from, what some of their influences are, and that'll help you understand why they feel a certain way and why they're doing what they're doing. So the listening here is almost as important as talking. And the last one is tell your story. Right? Everyone, especially kids, love stories. And everyone's climate story is different and unique and valid. So, you know, talk about why you started caring about climate change. How did that make you feel? And what actions are you taking now? You know, your story and knowing how many more people are doing it can be a powerful tool to help children understand and cope and feel safe in their own future. You know, a recent study from the University of Bath found that storytelling was the most effective way to teach primary school children about evolution, which is a very complex topic. The same goes for climate change. Climate chats with younger children don't need to really be riddled with facts or stats. Instead, they can be fun stories rooted in empathy, courage, and imagination about you know, how turtles confuse plastic bags for jellyfish and your own climate stories and experiences. So that's eco chat. Okay, great. So the chat is C for celebrate, H for honesty. A for ask questions, and T for tell your story. I was wondering if you might have an example or story that you can remember from a workshop? Sure. So when I ask parents to, or caregivers to come into a workshop, I ask them to think about the child or person that they want to talk about. And I asked them to write down a few attributes about them. And one person wrote, my child loves going out to the park, loves Lego, and loves ice cream. So we decided to pick Lego because that was a bonding exercise for the two of them, where they would actually build things together. And one way to have this conversation was to say, okay, so now you're making this Lego city. Once you're done building it, what's going to happen to the lego and you know the kid would say i don't know maybe pass it on or throw it away I'm not sure right well when you say okay, you're going to throw it away where's away where's that going to go you know the dustbin or you know I'm not sure and so the idea is then you, you talk to the child about it goes into the dustbin you know a lot of the trash that we throw away if it's not disposed of properly ends up in the ocean and that's like an aha moment. They're like, what? Wait, I didn't know that. And then you talk about how, you know, plastic, when it enters the ocean, right, it breaks down into teeny tiny pieces. And then fish and animals hurt, eat, eat these plastics. And then who eats the plastic? We do, right? So the idea of what goes around comes around, the trash that you throw away comes back right into our food system, even without knowing. So for a parent to be able to share that circularity of how things are all connected with a child is really a great way to sort of get them to realize about the impact of their actions, 
right? So these are the types of connections that we help parents make when they have these conversations. So it's just helping people understand it doesn't matter what the points of connection are. There's so many ways in which you can show the circularity of things and how we're all sort of connected to nature and how that maintaining that ecosystem is really important. Thank you for that example. That, that really makes it real for us. Marsha, I know that you've been part of the Cat Kid Adventure Climate Chat workshops, and I'd love to know more about how you came to the workshop and where you are now about it. I met Anu at the Palo Alto Art Center, and um, I had just gone through the exhibition that they had last fall on fire transforms. And following that walkthrough, we had a climate chat. There was a real subtleness and ease with which we came into the work, starting with talking about a relationship with climate, and which was wonderful for me, reconnecting with skiing and backpacking and the hiking that I do now and my appreciation of, of being out in nature. And the part that really stands out is the fear or the uncomfortableness that you're supposed to go in with a kind of a lecture is taken away. I wanted to have a conversation with a neighbor here where I live, which is in a senior community. And I wrote down the the hobbies that she had and somebody role played her and something very real and concrete happened in the conversation that really connected me with my neighbor. And what it was, it was around art. We both use a water-based paint and we looked at how, how could we not use too much fresh water for our work. And it was exciting. It really energized me. And I came back to my community and talked to my neighbor and said, it would be great if we could do this here. We have a climate action committee uh, of seniors who are wanting to, to do their part. And also I talked to people that are in the racial and social justice committee because we know how much climate has been often degraded more in in communities of people of color. So I shared the example and my neighbor, who was the person I talked to, became my ally so that we could now set up to have a climate chat here. One person, her son, happened to do a newsletter back on the East Coast. And it was like, wow, there's a place you could put in a little blurb little action that people could take every month and somebody else you know realized that their friend that they wanted to have a climate chat with was someone that sewed and perhaps the fabrics that she used could be ones that were saved from going into landfill so it's a very comfortable process and not pressured into having facts and figures though I did learn some in that first climate chat one of the grounding parts of it was to write a postcard. And I wrote to one of my grandsons. This took place in November. And November is no straw month. And so that was really good. I could tell him that the phrase around that is sip, don't suck your beverages. And humor, I think, helps a lot. Yes, they probably really liked that. Yes. (laughs) I'm sure it got quoted, what grandma said. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Good boy. Great. Well, that sounds excellent that you had the personal experience there at the art center with the climate chat. You took it back to your retirement community. Yeah, we're going to do it again. We're going to open it up to the larger community here. Great. And it sounds like it's already starting to ripple out to their spheres of influence, their families and friends. Yes, it is something that can be then spread word of mouth and through family channels, close friends, which often is how we are more open to new information because we trust them. Anu, how can folks, parents, caregivers, how can they get involved in a workshop or maybe even start one of their own? 
Well, they can reach out to me. All of our information is on our website, catcatadventure.com. And you just have to request. Ideally, it would be great if they have a group that they want to do it with already um, because then there is a inbuilt sense of trust and familiarity between people in the group, which always helps because, again, climate conversations are not things that you have often, even with people you know. So this is a way to break that and get a little s- a step further. If you reach out to me on my website, I'll let you know when the next one's coming up. And if you're interested in hosting your own, I'm happy to share the materials that we have, the EcoChat principles, walk you through it, and then you can take it and customize it. Great. And I know that you all have a follow-up newsletter also that goes to folks with conversation starters. Can you tell me a bit about that? What people leave with from our workshops is an energy, a sense of confidence about having these conversations. But what's also nice is to keep in touch on what's happening in the news and what's going on and bits of information which enable these conversations, right? So what we do is send a bi-weekly newsletter. We send these to people who have signed up as ways to kickstart those conversations. So we curate current news in bite-sized, easy, meaningful ways and offer them up so they can have them at breakfast, when walking in the park, when there's just a lull in conversation and you want to share something. We also share inspiring stories of kids and families taking action around the world. And I think it is a clear way to help combat any despair that children or adults, for that matter, might feel about a climate crisis which is so important because you have to provide both action and example to give hope. You know, every step in your journey is important and it's all about progress and not about perfection. Yes, thank you. And that goes to what you said earlier about how a climate chat is not a one and done. You refine it over time and you repeat and you add new information and it becomes kind of a normal thing that you do in your family or your community. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. The, the key is to have repeat conversations and the key is to find moments in your day-to-day living as a way to have those conversations. Simple things like I have a lawn in my house and I want to get rid of the lawn and have more local plants and native plants, it's a conversation to have with your child about it. Why do you want to get rid of your lawn, right? It is, yes, to save water, but also what are some of the benefits of having a native garden? So it's consciously having these conversations with the people around you. It could be with your neighbor. It could be with your child. It could be with, you know, anybody in your community. When you have those conversations frequently, It also signals to people that even if I don't know something, here's a safe space. I can say I don't know something and ask questions and debate and think about it. And that over time will inspire action, however small that is. And then one thing leads to another. When you see your neighbors doing something or you doing something, you influencing other people, I think that just grows in its impact. And you learn something new. It can be so fun. I heard about compostable sneakers that a San Diego professor developed. And they don't compost right while you're wearing them, but when you're finished with them. And to me, that's very heartening and hopeful to learn about these things. And they're like what Anu's saying, they're very possible and doable. The idea of giving people alternatives is really, really important. The idea that You can still do what you want to do, but here's a better way of doing it. An example we use is eating ice cream in a cone. If you want to have ice cream, can you think about buying it in a cone and not a plastic cup and spoon so you have no waste? Kids are so good about thinking of different ways to do things. They can be quite clever and creative and sometimes just funny. Yeah, a lot of what can happen is really replacing old behaviors or old products with Mm -hmm. new ones. The idea of reusing and recycling, that's good, but 
also replacing and maybe even refusing some things might be another way to think about it. Every Earth Day, uh, we have a publication called the Cat Kid Adventure Post. And it is a tool for parents and educators to talk to their kids about current environmental issues. And this edition is about the impact of plastics in the ocean and how kids can be better stewards of their environment, but also help kick that habit of single-use plastic. And through this publication, kids have games that they play to learn what some of these actions might be. So one of the ways to reduce the stuff you have is to, like you said, simply say no. It's those little moments when someone offers you a straw or a bag and all it takes is the smallest word, which is no. So what we help kids do is, you know, practice saying no. So some of the sort of taglines that we'll have is, you know, my best friend is a sea turtle and I promised I wouldn't. Or no thank you, I have a magical reusable bag. It makes plastic disappear. Or no thank you, I'd rather sit than suck, right? So these are all just suggestions, but kids can come up with their own and then, you know, we encourage them to practice it and share it with us. How can you reuse a takeout container, for example? It could be a storage box to store your Lego, your unicorns, or it could be, you can turn those into bowling pins, or you can make a colorful beer bird feeder, right? So it's a way to help them rethink that, okay, I can reuse this for as long as I can before, you know, having to discard it. So the idea is to let kids know that this is happening and then have them share their solutions. How would you repack your lunchbox? in a more sustainable manner, for example. So these are all small examples, but the goal is to meet kids where they're at in their lives and give them strategies to make better decisions. You're based in Palo Alto. What about other communities that may have different experiences with the climate crisis? While I do workshops with parents and community members in Palo Alto, there are people from other communities that come to these workshops at the libraries. And everybody has a different experience. But because it's you know rooted in a lot of fun and engagement, those barriers are sometimes broken down. And it's very simple actions that we're talking about sometimes that they're able to take and the learning that they're able to take and share. The idea of sharing actions and sharing conversations and sharing experiences is really, really key to bringing about the social change that we need in order to normalize taking climate action and talking about climate. And, you know, our social media channels, our Facebook, but most importantly, our Instagram channel, we have a lot of kids sharing actions that they're taking and we feature them as a way to showcase to other parents that here are the things that are happening and here are ways in which you can get involved. Think about how can you expand into a larger sphere of influence because you do have that influence. Thanks again, Anu and Marsha, for your thought-provoking insights. And I look forward to the climate conversations continuing. Thank you for having us. It was a wonderful discussion. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Hey, listener, Anu and Marsha have shared some great resources on how to take the next step in having climate conversations in your community. Just check out the show notes below to follow the links. For this episode of Everyday Climate Champions, the sound designer was Kayla Anchel. I served as the executive producer and editor and your host. Our full production team is listed below in the show notes. Music is by Blue Dot Sessions. You've been listening to Everyday Climate Champions, presented by the Climate Reality Project's Bay Area chapter. If you know any local folks who would make great guests, please drop us an email. As climate reality founder and former U.S. Vice President Al Gore says, solving the climate crisis is within our grasp, but we need people like you to stand up and act. To learn more, please visit climaterealitybayarea.org. See you next time.